All right, folks. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon for uh, this tutorial. Uh, we have Dominic O'Kane uh, with his tutorial uh, today. Uh, Dominic uh, is a professor of finance at the EDHEC Business School in Nice, France. And he has around 12 years of industry experience with uh, 10 years of academic experience as well. And his tutorial today will be uh, a Python library for financial security valuation and risk management. Over to you, uh, Dominic. Okay, thank you very much, Neet. Um, so let me first begin by saying that I'm delighted to be invited to, to speak at your conference in Hyderabad. Um, it's a shame I can't be there, and, and maybe that could happen in the future. Um, so this is, this is my first uh, public talk about Finance Pi, which is something I've been working on for about a year and a half. Um, I hope it won't be the last, but... Um, I've been working on this for a number of months, well, for a year and a half, but intensively for the last several months. And uh, I'm keen to share it with you and also to get feedback on what I've done. OK, so let me begin. So the overview of this talk will be, first of all, I'm going to talk about what exactly is Finance Pi. And that will involve a quick introduction to financial derivatives. I assume that some of you may know what they are, but I also assume that some may not. So I think it's worth giving a little description just so I can motivate the purpose of the library. Next, I want to talk about the design of Finance Pi. So why have I designed it in the way I have and what does that mean? So I'll talk about that in more detail in a few slides. Then I'm going to give a few case studies. So I'm just going to give you some examples of Finance Pi being used to solve a couple of problems and also to do some performance test. So I'll show you those case studies. And um, I think some uh, Snead has just posted a link to the GitHub repository where I've actually put the slides for this presentation and some notebooks that you can download if you want to try, try uh, some of the, the Finance Pi uh, notebooks. Um, I want to talk about the alternatives to Finance Pi so you can understand what is already out there and why Finance Pi effectively plugs a, a gap in the market. And then I'll talk about where to start, how to start using the library, and talk about contributing to the library. And obviously, I'll, I'll end with my conclusions. So what is Finance Pi? So Finance Pi is a Python-based library for the valuation of financial securities. So financial securities are bonds, equities. But in addition, it also focuses on financial derivatives, because that is where the modeling and the more advanced needs, analytical computational needs are. If you want to look at it, if you want to find it, it's on GitHub under my repository. It's called Finance Pi, and it's, uh, it's all there. So uh, if I've already been introduced, but let me just say I do have quite a lot of background in finance. Um, for 12 years, I worked in the industry in Wall Street in London. And for the last 10 years, I've been teaching finance as a professor at a business school in France. So I have a lot of industry knowledge, so I understand kind of what's important to the people in the business. And I also understand, you know, the needs, the utility of having a library for purposes of teaching. Uh, and one of the things I've been teaching over the years, I've taught C++ for finance. More recently, I convinced them to allow me to switch to teaching Python for finance. And this is something which I hope to use in my in my teaching in the next you know, beginning beginning very soon. Um, most of the work has been done by me, and actually a lot of the work is taking code that I've developed over the last 10, 15 years, uh, much of it in C++ or C Sharp and other, even VBA, and putting that into the library. Um, I've also had some contributions. My son, Fergal, who's 19 and is doing computer studies degree, has helped a bit, and also Rudvi, who's one of the organizers there, has also been helping with some of the work around American option pricing. Um, so the library is very broad in scope. It handles a broad range of asset classes. So derivatives on bonds, equities, currencies, interest rates, inflation. And the next thing I'm working on is commodities. And it also does, as I say, it does those assets and derivatives. So let me talk about very briefly about what are derivatives. So derivatives are final 
financial contracts with payoffs linked to the price of market assets. So you can think of the payoff as some sort of function, some sort of you know, mathematical function. And the inputs to that function are the underlying, are the prices of the underlying assets. And it's called a derivative because the value of, of the financial contract, this derivative contract, is derived from the price of the underlying asset. So it's got nothing to do with first derivatives. It's to do with the fact that the price is derived from the price of the underlying asset. The financial derivatives market is enormous. Um, depending on how you count it, you know, you can get numbers as big as $700 trillion. So it's a substantial, substantial market. And the reasons why derivatives exist is really to transfer risk. So banks can protect themselves against the changes in funding rates. Banks borrow money, they lend money, and they have an exposure to changes in interest rates. Derivatives can help them to reduce these exposures. A company expecting a payment in one particular currency wants to protect that from in the future, wants to protect against that currency going against them, can buy a contract to hedge that risk. Farmers want to guarantee the price of their harvest in advance. A derivative can help them do this. An internet startup can't afford to pay its um, employees a high salary, but gives them upside through, through options. That's another example of a derivative. And investors who want to take specific risk return profiles may design their own derivatives, with their own particular payoffs. The simplest non-trivial derivative that I want to introduce now is the call option. So the call option is basically something that an investor would buy. So somebody who wants to have exposure to a stock for, say, a period of a year, but is conservative and doesn't want to lose too much money if the stock price falls. If they were to buy the stock, and let's say the stock is trading at 100, and if over the year the stock price fell to 80, they'd have lost $20. If the stock price goes up to, 20, up to 120, they will make $20. However, they're very concerned about the downside. They definitely don't want to lose those $20 if the stock price falls. So one way to avoid this is to buy a, a call option. The call option is structured. So it says that the, the owner of the call option, let's say it's a one-year call option because that's the investor's horizon. If after one year, the buyer of the option has the right to buy the stock in one year at a strike price, which is equal to today's price of 100. So the point is, you say, well, why does this help? Well, it's best to show you just a payoff diagram. And this is effectively the, what the derivative is doing. The derivative is, is this basically this payoff formula. And what it says that if the stock price in one year is less than 100, you have the option to buy the stock at a price of 100. You would never exercise that option because you can always buy the stock more cheaply in the market. If, however, the stock price is greater than 100, then you are now able to buy for $100 what other people in the market have to pay more than $100 for. So you have this payoff, which is always good. You know, either you don't exercise, in which case there's no payoff, or you do exercise, in which case you have a positive payoff. So there's no way to lose, except for the fact that you have to buy the option. You have to pay for this option and somebody has to determine the price of this option. And this is what Finance Pi does. Finance Pi gives you the analytical capabilities to price this option. And I will talk about that in a, in a few minutes. So what is the design of Finance Pi? Well, I've used quite a lot of finance libraries over my time, and this has influenced me in how I designed Finance Pi. And it's fairly straightforward. So let me just describe it. So First of all, the library is broken down into kind of four main categories. First of all is fin utils. So these are really helper functions that are used across the library. Okay, I'll talk about those in a bit in a minute. Primarily to do with date generation, some mathematical calculations, but things that are commonly used across the whole library. The second category of the design or second component is the market. So in order to price a derivative, you need to have market inputs. You need to know what the price of the equity is. You need to know what the price of, of the interest rates are. You may need more information like volatility surfaces and things like that. So I have a, a market concept. There's also models. The models are the things which calculate the result. 
they calculate the price. So those are also a different type of entity. We have, I have objects, which are models. And finally, there are products. Because everything in finance is, I'm buying a particular product. I'm buying a call option, a put option. And there's a whole zoo of different types of securities that you can buy. And each of these securities I have encapsulated as a, as a Python class. So let me talk about FinUtils in a little bit more detail. So the problem, one of the problems with finance is there are, there are a lot of market conventions. And we have to make sure that we agree with these correct exactly in our modeling framework. So one of the things that's most problematic or in, in finance is dates. And dates are key to determining valuation because $1 paid in one year is not worth today the same as $1 paid in two years. But it's actually even more fine than that. $1 paid in one year is actually not the same, does not have the same present value as $1 paid in one year and one day. And those differences, although they're small, they're actually important. So we have to make sure that we pin things down to exact days. Um, calendars are also another issue. When cash flows get paid, they have to get paid on days which are business days. So we need to know where the trade is being done. If it's in New York or Europe, it will have a different calendar than if it's being done in, in London, for example. Um, and we need to generate cash flows according to particular rules. So these are quite complicated, and it's but it's very, very important to get these right. As I said, the timing of the cash flow has to be captured exactly. So that's the utilities component. The next one is the products or the instruments. So these are all the different securities and derivative securities that are currently covered by the library. So I have bonds, which are basically, you know, buy, you know how governments borrow. Um, and you can see here, you can see that we have fin bond. I prefix all of my objects with, the, with fin, just to make it easy for the, the user to distinguish them. So I have fin bond, and bond. I have convertible bonds, bonds with embedded options, floating rate notes, futures contracts on bonds, mortgages, and options on bonds. I do credit as well. So I have things called credit, called credit default swaps, baskets, indexes on credit default swaps, options on the index. A whole, there's a whole range of products there. Funding or, or also interest rates, that's something that I've also covered. And this is one of the most complicated and technical and fast moving areas of the market. So this has been covered in a lot of detail. And in actuality, the fin eyeball swap, which you can see halfway down this list, of that $700 billion of outstanding notional in the derivatives market, the fin eyeball swap is probably about 650, sorry, trillion, 650 of those trillion. So it's a big, it's a, it's a very heavily trade, it's a, it's a very important product. In the equities market, we have a lot of complicated options with all sorts of features. We have American options, barrier options, baskets. So those have all been covered. In FX, we have a similar range of products. And we also have things called inflation bonds and inflation swaps and commodities. So you can see that right now, this is what's being covered at the moment. This will grow, but this is already substantial. And each one of these, let me just remind you, is a, an actual Python class. So under the product uh, area. So as I said, discounting future cash flows is essential, but not only do we need to know on what date the cash flow occurred, we also need to know exactly what interest rate to use to discount it. And one of the biggest and most technical problems in financial markets is being able to model the interest rate correctly and use the correct interest rate for the correct date. So I'm not going to go into the details because it's it's quite complicated, but I've presented here a whole range of ways to effectively parameterize or set up the interest rate term structure. That means that the interest rate that you get charged for borrowing for one year, two years, three years, out to say 50 years, is different for every single maturity date. And we need a way to capture that and these discount curves 
provide a number of different ways of cap to capture this. We also need another input, which is called volatility. When we come to options, this is very important. So I also have a, a set of classes which capture, they're basically containers which do some calculations for this volatility input. So these are effectively market inputs. These are the things that are changing all the time that you need to put into the derivative valuation formula, into the derivative valuation model, in order to get a price coming out. Then there are models. So once again, there's a whole zoo of models that I've set up. They are categorized in different ways. But you know, we have different types of processes, log normal processes, some for interest rates, some for credit, some which have got normal processes. By processes, I mean the stochastic dynamics for the underlying variable. And we also have things called stochastic volatility. I won't go into these at all in any detail, except to say that this is fairly broad coverage. There are other models out there that I'm intending to add to this, but this is already quite substantial. And the reason why this is separate from the products is that models are not product specific. The same model can be used in the valuation of a whole range of products. So we have to decouple these from the models, from the products. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through the modeling the whole set of modeling because it's it's not really the forum for it but there's a lot of work that's been done in the library around bond yield curve fitting what's called eyeball discount curves i'm not going to list all of these multi-factor libor models etc cetera, etc cetera. so there is a very comprehensive range of models that have been implemented in the library um, because for all of those products that you've seen each, each of those requires a particular model or may even have a number of different models that can be used. And therefore, there's been a need to build all of these models for that. So what is the overall design? OK, so if I'm going to start using Finance Pi, how does it really work? Well, the first stage is that you create a product. So you set up, a, for example, a call option, which I've already described. So you set up the call option. And that then contains within it all the information about a call option. <coughs> Excuse me. Which, from a, from what I said a few slides ago, um, the call option is basically what is the strike price, and what is the expiry date? What is the time in the future when I have to exercise the option? So, from a design perspective, it's a, a product is basically holds that particular information, but it also has all of the methods associated with it for the valuation of that particular product. If I want to do the valuation, I take the product and I have methods which are part of the product class. And those take inputs, primarily being a model input and market input. So to kind of draw it out a little bit schematically, I have a model object, which could be one of these models that I showed on the slide previously. I have a market object, and this actually may have more than one object. It may be a discount curve, so the interest rate object, and it may also include a volatility object related to, but that depends on the product, which particular market inputs are required. Those go into the product object, which has already been created, and they go through its value method. That will also rely on fin utils for various functions that it will re require in order to generate cash flows and other things, and that will output a valuation. So this is kind of the general framework for how, how, how the, the library is designed. How the library is used? Well, the output valuation can be accessed either you know, simply through a Jupyter notebook. If you're a, a quant or somebody or an, an analyst who's trying to basically just do some real time pricing and testing and things like that. Or you can just implement this into your system. If you have a, like a, a risk management system or a valuation system, and call all of this directly from, from Python. OK, so now let me start showing you just actually some real examples of using the library, because that's only when it starts to crystallize kind of what I've talked about so far. So let's take an example of a government bond. So a government bond is how governments borrow. And let's suppose that the government borrows by issuing a bond 
And that bond is basically issued and they promise to pay you a 5% coupon every year for 10 years. So here, for example, I've said, well, let's we lend the government £1,000 and we get back £1,000 at the end. But every year we get an annual payment of £50. That's the interest rate. OK, that's the interest payment. So I can easily set up something that looks like this in Finance Pi. So in the set of notebooks, there's one called Case Study Analyzing a Bond. So the first thing I do is, so this is just a um, an image from that particular notebook. So the first thing I do in my notebook is I import NumPy just because it's useful for various calculations that you may want to do while you're doing the analysis. I also import matplotlib for doing the, for doing the um, graphic graphics or graphing things. Then I introduce finance pi. So from finance pi, it has a subcategory called fin utils, which I've already described, and I import everything from that. Okay, that gives me all of the date, calendar, all of the special market conventions that will have to be used. I have a subcategory also under finance pi called products, and under that I have a subcategory called bonds, and in that I have an object called a fin bond. So I import all of that. Okay, and when that gets calculated you get this rather verbose sort of welcome message, which I have added just to make sure that people understand that, you know, I've got a disclaimer and uh, I'm looking for, for comments and how to contact me. So this is it's really for the beta version. OK, so I've pretty much said said what these points are actually saying. So that's how that's how we how I start pretty much every notebook. Obviously, for notebooks involving options, I don't import fin bond but I always import NumPy and Matplotlib. Okay, so here's me now actually using the notebook to do some analysis. So the first thing for the bond is I want to create a bond. So the first input I have is the issue date. That's the date on which the bond is issued. So let's assume that that's the 15th of May, 2020. And the bond has a maturity date. That's when it repays the money, the principal. And that's 10 years later. That's 15th of May, 2030. The coupon is 0.05, which means 5%. Okay? And the frequency type, uh, you have to specify in a bond, is it paying every year, is it paying every six months, or every three months? So here I'm using, as you'll see, I'm using enums for categorical values. So I set up a, quite a lot of enums to make it very easy and obvious for users to know exactly how to pass in particular categorical values. So if you want to pass in annual to say that the payments are annual, you use this thing called fin frequency types, and it has a particular value called annual that you can pass in. Um, the accrual type is another particular input that it needs. I won't describe what it means, but that's something that it needs as well. And it needs to know how much of the bond you're buying. That's the face amount, and that's equal to 1 million. Uh, I set up 1 million as a, as a sort of string, as a sort of value like that. Uh, to save myself from having to count the number of zeros. Um, and I think it's actually quite useful because it's safer. OK, so the final thing that you do is we create the bond object. So you can see here, I have bond is equal to fin bond, and I pass in each of those inputs. So these are all inputs that are intrinsic to a bond. These describe the bond. There's no market inputs here. These are all inputs that describe exactly how a bond is structured. OK, so on the next slide, you can see that I'm one thing I, I you want to be able to do is you want to interrogate the object just to make sure that it's done, that it, that it has the right inputs. So every single method, every single product has a print method. By I basically use the underscore underscore REPR method um, so that you can print every single object to interrogate it to find out what, what the internals are. This is quite good for testing and debugging. And, and for reporting. So you can see here the bond has been set up exactly how I, how I wanted it. Uh, I also I always make sure that I send I print the object type so that's completely clear to the user as well. Um, you may wonder, okay, there's a lot of functionality in the library. How do I find out about what's there and what's and how it works? Well, you can always type help bond in a notebook and that will give you a uh, kind of a verbose listing of kind of all the, the comments in the bond class. But I've also set 
I also wrote some code to create an auto-generated user guide. So you'll see in the actual download from the GitHub repository that there's a PDF in there, and that's basically the user guide. And it's a lot, you'll see there's a lot of uh, functionality in the library because the guide is around 300, well, it's 339 pages long right now. Okay, so that's where you can go and get more information. You can also look at the code, which is fairly straightforward. Most of the methods are self-contained, so you don't have to go through lots of levels and steps in order to kind of find out exactly where the calculation is being done. It's all fairly sort of self, it's, it's all fairly obvious in a way. Okay, one thing I've also done is that, you know, I've seen working in finance, I've seen that it's very easy for a user to accidentally put the wrong input into a particular function. And in the world of finance, errors cost money and they can cost a lot of money. So what I want to do is I want to do quite careful validation of inputs. And one first level of, of validation is just checking that the user has entered something which is of the right type. Now, obviously, Python is is not, there's no typing in Python, but there is a type hints feature that is now um, available. So in most of the functions, and here I have the, fond, the bond class, so this is the top of the bond class. You can see in the init function, I've used type hints against each of the inputs. And I also have a function called check argument types, <coughs> which actually does check to make sure that the, that the inputs do actually correspond to the types as described here. So this just gives an extra level of security to make sure that the user gets a, you know, an error message which is useful rather than getting some, something crashing or something failing for some inexplicable reason because they typed in you know, a number for the frequency rather than an enum. Uh, I only do this type checking for kind of interface functions to the user because I don't want to, I don't want to overload the, um, I don't want to overload the code with too much type checking. This is really at the interface to the user. Okay, down in the modeling code, I don't do any type checking because once it's got through the layer to the user and it's all been validated, it's assumed that everything is is thereafter is going to be fine. So let me just move on quickly. Okay, so. We've created our bond. We can interrogate our bond and say, print the cash flows. So I need to tell it the settlement date as of when we want to know the cash flows, because in three years' time, I, I don't want to know about cash flows that have already been paid. And here is just the cash flows of the bond and the 5% paid on a million pounds, which is what I said was the face value, means 50,000 pounds or $50,000 per year. And at maturity, you get back the initial million plus that $50,000 again. So this is just useful analytics so you can understand what's going on inside the bond. One particular important value in the bond is the yield. So given a price, you should be able to calculate a yield. And a yield is a very important number in finance because most traders actually trade using the yield rather than by negotiating a price. So you need to make sure it's exactly right. So you have to calculate what's called the yield to maturity according to the market conventions, and you have to make sure that it's done correctly. So there are different market conventions. So here's just an example. If the, you have to know the price in order to calculate the yield, and okay, obviously a bond that you pay a lot for is going to have a lower yield than a bond that you can buy cheaply if, it's, if both bonds are paying the same coupon. So here we have the yield to maturity calculation, and it's a very fast calculation. I mean, you're solving a one-dimensional root search here, but in Python, I'm, I'm solving a 1D equation. I use NumPy root search function, and it's, it's instant, okay? Everything works very quickly, and it's, it's, very, uh, it's very nice. Okay, so what else is there? So there are a lot of bond-specific functions. You can access them if you just hit the tab key on the bond, and you can see exactly what, uh, what exactly is available. So this is, this is a very nice feature of the Jupyter Notebook. It allows the user to see the, the available functionality. And you can see that there's already quite a lot of functions. So just to re recap on the whole design, I create a bond. A bond contains all of the characteristics of a bond. And then you have all of these functions that then can 
can then be called on the bond object, which you can then pass in other values which are to do with the market and to do with perhaps a model, and you will get values back from those. Okay, let me talk about another example. So a second example is valuing an option. So I've already motivated kind of what options I'm describe what a call option is. So as I said earlier, a call option is basically an expiry date, a strike price, and you have to say the type of option. So the one I introduced earlier was a call option. That gives you the right to buy. There is also something called a put option, which gives you the, the option to sell in the future. And that's something that you would buy if you want to kind of have a negative view on a stock. Now, I, you'll see the word vanilla here. Um, it's got nothing to do with ice cream. It's really just the word vanilla is, is to do with the fact that something that is very standard is in America, they, they like to use the word plain vanilla, okay? And the equity call option is the most standard option, okay? And I also want to distinguish it from all the other types of options that I've implemented. So, uh, so here's, I'm just gonna consider options on equities. In the library, we have options on FX, we have options on interest rates, we have options on commodities. Here, I'm just looking at options on equities. Each of these is subtly different, okay? The payoff is similar, but they have to be handled differently. For example, company stocks pay dividends, and that makes them different from interest rates, for example. So, okay. So the type of object is called a fin equity vanilla option. And I have a very strict naming convention that should make it easier for people to find the name or you even to guess the name of the product. Um, so let me just go. Okay, so here we are gonna try and create one of these fin equity vanilla options. Okay, so I have to specify, so let's just go through the, the notebook. So this is the second notebook that you'll find in that particular folder on, on the GitHub. So the first thing I need to define is what is the expiry date of the option? Okay, so I say it's the 1st of June, 2021. Okay, the strike price I said equal to 100. So those are the actual things that describe the option along with the description as to whether it's a call option or whether it's a put option. Once again, I'm using enums for the user so the user can describe the type of option just using that enum. And this makes it very easy to avoid all sorts of problems. Okay, then you can print the call option. So I, I create the call option using the fin equity vanilla option constructor and then I print it and you can see all the internals. Uh, one of the internals I didn't pass in, that was the number of options, okay? And that's because I just set it as a def default argument. In fact, in many cases, many of these products have got default arguments and where it's possible to use a default argument, I use it because there is a concept of a market standard. However, I do also allow for the fact that some people may want to deviate from the market standard so they can override the default argument. But by having default arguments, which is something that you can set up very easily in Python, it makes life very easy for the user who only wants to deal with very standard types of products. Okay, so how do we do the valuation? So, I've, so let me just say, I've created the equity vanilla option. How do I want to value it? Well, there is a standard valuation model called Black-Scholes, which um, is widely accepted as the market standard, okay? And I don't really want to get into a debate because <laughs> there is a lot of debate around how to, whether it's the right price and things like that, but it's widely accepted as the market standard for quotation purposes at least. Okay, so what does the Black-Scholes option valuation model need to know? Well, if I want to value this option, this call option that I just described, First of all, it needs to know the number of years to the expiry date. Well, it already knows the expiry date. So what it needs to know is what is today's date? What is the valuation date? It also needs to know the stock price today. It needs to know the level of interest rates out to the expiry date of the option. It needs to know the dividend rate. Stocks pay dividends. It needs to know what that dividend rate is going to be over the time between today and the expiry date of the option. And it needs to know what the volatility of the stock price is expected to be between today and the expiry date of the option. So these are all effectively market inputs, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So we're gonna do the option valuation now. So here we have the notebook again. 
and we can see the value date and we're using my fin date class and that's the 6th of December 2020. So this option roughly has six months to go because it expires in June of 2021. <coughs> Excuse me. The stock price today, I'm just going to have a drink. So the stock price today is 90 <coughs> and the dividend yield is 1%. Now, I've talked at length about interest rates. So I said already that there are several ways of representing the term structure of interest rates. And I set these up as what are called fin discount curve objects. The simplest one that we will assume is just that the interest rate curve is flat. It's the same interest rate irrespective of the maturity date of the borrowing. So I call this a fin discount curve flat object. And here I set it equal to 2%. So I need to pass in the value date. So that is kind of the anchor date for the curve, the level of the interest rate, and the frequency at which that interest rate is compounded. And that gives me what's called a discount curve. Okay, the final input before I can do evaluation is the model. Okay, so I've talked about the model. So here the model is Black Scholes. And Black Scholes is a model that has only got, I won't, it makes certain assumptions, but it only has one input, which is the volatility. And here that number is 20%. So I create a model object from the Finn model Black Scholes class. And now I have all the market inputs and the model inputs, and I can put those into the call option dot value method, pass in the value date, the stock price today, the discount curve that I want to use, the dividend yield and the model. And I get back the price, which you see is $1.8. And that's the option valued. Okay. So now the point about having all these different classes for models and things is that even though this is the market standard model, Black Scholes is not the one that's widely used within investment banks. Uh, they use far more sophisticated models that have stochastic volatility and more, more complex assumptions. But I've, I've modeled, I've set up all of those models as well. So all you have to do is create a different model object using a different model and pass it into the function in exactly the same way. And you will get a different price because that would be price implied by an alternative model. So you can very easily switch models here without doing very much work. Other libraries may require you to call a different function, but I've designed it differently here. You just pass in a different object. One thing that's very important when you're doing analysis, especially in the Jupyter Notebooks, is, is trying to do sensitivity analysis. So there are lots of inputs into, a, into an option valuation, as you've already seen. And varying one of the inputs usually means writing some sort of loop, okay? And if you have to do a lot of this, it, it quickly makes your Jupyter Notebook very ugly and slow. So FinancePy avoids this by doing a lot of vectorization. Um, some of this is automatic because NumPy actually gives you that for free in very many cases. But there are lots of cases where NumPy, where the particular product type is such that NumPy doesn't allow you to to, to, to vectorize the calculation. So in that case, I've had to handwrite a number of functions for which you passed in a vector of inputs. It has to basically internally um, iterate through those. The good thing is that that is abstracted away from the user, and it means that their Jupyter notebook is, you know, is very clean. So you'll see a lot of this in, in, the, in the notebooks that I have. For example, here is one for the call option. So let's say, for example, I want to know the sensitivity to the value of the call option to changes in the stock price. So here I use the np.lin space function to give myself a, a list or a vector of values going from 60 to 140 with 100 intervals. And then I pass that into the call option value function. You can see the second input there is, the, is that vector of stock prices. And the value I get out that gets assigned to the variable values is actually that whole list of all the call option values for each of those different stock prices. 
I can just plot those using matplotlib and just say plot stock prices, comma values. And I get a nice, I get a nice picture like this. So this makes life very easy for the user, especially in the Jupyter Notebook framework to do sensitivity analysis. And which is something which is a, a very important component of pricing and understanding derivative securities. Okay, the last case study I want to talk about is um, some optimization. So I want to talk about using NumPy and Number in order to improve the uh, speed. Okay, so NumPy, I think you're probably all familiar with it. You know, it's an open source numerical library. It gives you a lot of vectorized calculations and it uses compile code to perform a lot of complicated calculations. So it's a very powerful tool. Um, you do need to know how to vectorize the calculations. And in some cases, as I've just stated, sometimes the calculation cannot be vectorized. So you need to know when that's possible and when it's not possible. And if it is possible, you need to work out how to do that. Number is an open source JIT compiler. I think you probably all know about it already. Um, it's very nice, as I'm going to show you. It basically compiles your code. Um, and it's it's trivial to implement. You just add a decorator to the Python function. And I have to say a hat tip to Yves Hilpish, who I know spoke yesterday, whose uh, excellent book, Python for Finance, first alerted me to the, the power of number, uh, which was a, a revelation. OK, so why, why do I care about speed? I mean, I've already shown you that most of the calculations are already fast. There's a particular area called Monte Carlo pricing which is when I have a complicated payoff, um, sometimes I don't have a formula that gives me a closed form expression to calculate the value. So the only way to actually price the derivative is to use Monte Carlo. So the way Monte Carlo works is that, for example, let's, I, I actually do have a formula for pricing a call option, but let's say assume that we didn't have a formula. How would we do it in Monte Carlo? Well, I would simulate many thousands of parts Basically, I would simulate different values for the final stock price at the expiry date of the option according to a particular model. In Black-Scholes, that is assuming that the stock price is log normally distributed. Okay? So I would simulate many thousands of log normally distributed stock prices. In each of those parts, I would calculate what is the payoff of the option on the expiry date according to that payoff diagram that I showed you way back at the start. Then for each of those parts, I have a payoff. I then average over those payoffs to get the average payoff. And then I discount that average back to today using interest rates. I discount it back. I present value it to get the price. Now, how accurate is the value that I'm going to get from this? Well, the, the, the accuracy of this depends very much on the number of parts. Okay? If we're just doing naive Monte Carlo with pseudo random numbers, the more parts we have, the better the accuracy of the, of the option value coming out. And the question I posed myself when I started working on Finance Pi is, is Finance Pi going to be fast enough to compete with, say, C++ quant libraries? Okay, so that was the question. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, an example here to see if that, what the answer to that question is. So here I'm taking a very simple, this isn't actually the code in the library. This is just a sort of um, pseudo code. It is Python, but it's kind of not the actual code, but it is pseudo code that I've written in order to just explain what I've done in the library to test this. So first thing is, <clears throat> I'm going to do a pure Python function. So here you see a function which is calculating the price of the call option. So let me describe very briefly what's going on in the function. So it's called value MC1. It takes in the inputs, which are just very trivially as S0 is the initial stock price, T is the time to expiry, K is the strike price, R is an interest rate, Q is the dividend rate, V is the volatility. NumPass is the number of parts I'm going to use in the Monte Carlo. And the seed is just the random number seed that allows me to get a, uh, uh, allows me to see the uh, the sequence of random numbers. So you'll see that there's two lines with just some pre-calculations. Don't worry about those. Those are just in order to get the, to set up what's called the, the risk neutral uh, framework for the, for the price of the stock at the expiry date. 
The first big calculation is the generation of random numbers. So I generate one random number for each path, and it's a Gaussian random number. I then set up the payoff equal to zero, and I do a loop over the number of paths, and each of these is cal calculating a value of the final stock price in each path. That is then used, this is the formula for the payoff of the call option. That is the payoff. I increment the payoff variable, and then when I finish doing all the paths, I multiply that by this. This is the discounting. Don't worry about the formula, but this is how you discount the cash flow back to today. And I divide by the number of paths because I want to calculate the average. So this is how you would do Monte Carlo in Python without any sort of help. So, OK, so that's the first thing. That's pure Python. Now, you can imagine that's going to be pretty slow, but let's let's let's. OK, so I. I have a few little annotations here just to repeat what I've already said. So you generate the random numbers, there's a loop over parts, and then you do the averaging. Obviously, the slowest part here, which is all in Python, is going to be the loop over the parts. If I do this using NumPy, I can simplify the code a lot because what I can do is I can actually convert that loop into a series of vectorized calculations. So I do the pre-calculations in the same way. I generate the random numbers in the same way. But then I generate all of the individual parts using the vectorization inside NumPy. So I, I calculate, I use the maximum function, which does the element-wise max function on each of the elements in the, in the uh, NumPy array that S is going to produce. And I use the np.mean function to calculate the average payoff. So that does an internal loop over all of the elements in the payoff vector and divides that by the number of elements. And then I calculate the, the, the payoff in the same way as I did on the previous slide. So you can see now the loop over, over NumParts has now been replaced by vectorized calculations using NumPy. So how good is the improvement? Uh, by the way, I have to apologize for not using snake case uh, to my C++, but I am going to transition to no case quite soon. So what is the effect of um, using NumPy? It's huge. I mean, this is kind of not new to many of you, but I just wanted to quantify it and perform these experiments myself to see how good it is. And you can see this is doing a number of paths going from the lowest is around 20,000 going up to 200,000 paths. So you can see 200,000 parts. It takes roughly 25, well, it takes roughly a quarter of a second um, in pure Python, where it takes about 10 milliseconds to do it when you've got NumPy. So a speed increase of 25, which is huge already. But can we do better? So the next thing I wanted to see is try using number. So I use number, it's very simple, you just import it and add a decorate to the Python. So you can see that this is exactly the same function that we saw two slides ago where we saw the pure Python. All I've done is add the number decorator to it. Um, you can see that I've specified what are the types of all the inputs to help number figure out what everything is. I set the cache equal to true so that it doesn't rebuild it every time I run it. And I use fast math, which is a slightly less precise mathematics that, that actually runs more quickly because really in the world of option pricing, you know, we're happy if we have accuracy of say 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight. Okay, that's $1 and 10 million is pretty much sufficient accuracy. Okay, so the question is then, what is the impact of this? Okay, so I've just got an annotation that just says what I've just said. And I also added the number decorated to the NumPy function. So the NumPy function I showed you two slides ago, I added a number decorator to that as well, just to compare everything. And this is what I find. So pure NumPy, okay, so this is not, there's no pure Python anymore. I've taken that away because that's far too slow. So the first graph is pure NumPy. So this is just NumPy only. We're just doing the vectorization. That's what we've already seen. If I combine NumPy and number, so if I take the pure NumPy and add a number decorator to it, I already get a big improvement. But if I then 
just take the pure Python and add number to it, the speed up is, is even greater. So I've gone down from about one second. And also, this is now doing 20 million paths. It's not doing 200,000 because everything is so much faster. I can increase the number of paths. So this is 20 million paths on the right hand side. So I've gone from about one second down to about 0.4 seconds. So roughly, you know, I've halved the speed by using NumPy, by using number, which is impressive. Um, by the way, all three algorithms give identical results. They're all using exactly the same sequence of random numbers that was generated by NumPy. I did one last uh, test the other day. Um, I thought I'm just going to code this up in C++ and just see how well it performs. And so I did it in Visual Studio. I did it in Release. I did it in the O2 Optimize version. And I have to say, I mean, this, I'm sure, I, I'm sure with more time, I could probably make this much better, but it was actually slower than all of the Python examples that I've just shown you. Why is it slower? Well, it, it shouldn't really be slower, okay? Uh, it's because I haven't optimized it. Um, and the main thing I haven't optimized is the random number generator. So the only reason C++ seems to lose is probably because I'm not using a random number generator that's as fast as the one that's implemented in NumPy. Okay, but the point here, the point here is that even if the C++ can be optimized and this be doubled, NumPy and Number are actually still in very similar ballpark to C++. So the question is, yes, the question that I asked earlier is, can FinancePy start to even compete against libraries that are all in C++? The answer from this seems to be yes. Okay. And one final thing I did was I, I added a, I did the parallel pro, I added parallel equals true, and I changed range to P range in the, in the pure Python, and I got an, an additional speed up of about a factor of six to seven. So it's very clear that number allows you to get massive speed increases in the code for very little effort. And the great beauty of number, in my view, is that it leaves the code untouched. You can write very basic Python, which is very easy to understand. You don't have to get into any vectorization. So it makes the code very easy to understand. And if people want to you know, debug it and find out what's wrong with the code, it's, it's not hard to do it because the code is written in very basic Python. OK, so my final remarks. So who is this library aimed at? Well, it's aimed primarily at students and professors. That was my initial aim. because I want to use it in my teaching. Uh, and I teach quants, people who are going to go into the city, who want to be able to program and do analytics, but who need to understand finance. So you know, they're in that overlap between finance and Python. Traders who are on a trading desk who, who, may, who may want to do some of their own checking of a price, they could use this. Quantitative analysts, so people working for traders on trading desks, wanting to analyze the derivative price to see if the price is fair. If you're a particular investment fund and you call a bank and you want to get a quotation on a derivative and they give you a number, you can basically build very easily um, as a notebook to price the same thing and you can figure out if the price is fair and if it's not, you can go back and negotiate. Risk managers who want to do sensitivity analysis of a derivative price, you know, that, those, that's very important in the risk management. You want to know how much you could lose with certain probabilities. An investor who wants to buy a particular option, wants to test the strategy, could use it. And it's also useful for academics and researchers. If I want to build a model to price some particular type of derivative, all I have to do is to go into the model area in the library and add a new model and then code sort of effectively wire that into the product. And then I can test that with all of the benefits of knowing that the dates are correct, that the model is that the product has been set up right. So it gives you a certain amount of you know, existing stuff to start with. So you're not starting at zero when you're doing research or what are the alternatives? So who else is out there and who and where does Finance Pi sit relative to them? I think the main alternative out there is MATLAB, and it has a product called uh, the Financial Instruments Toolbox. 
Um, instruments is just what I call products. So it's basically a, a library of valuation functions that cover a very broad range of models and derivatives. Uh, and it's, it's kind of expensive. I mean, the annual license already for, license, for MATLAB is around $1,000 a year. And the financial toolbox costs another $800, roughly. It is very comprehensive. It has a lot of models implemented, covers a lot of products. Uh, and it's been in developed for many, many years, probably well over 10 years. It's fast for matrix calculations, and obviously it does a lot of vectorization, which is kind of one of the core things of, of MATLAB. Uh, it has good documentation and online support, but the code is a black box. You don't get to see what's going on under the bonnet. You don't get to see exactly what's being assumed in the code. And that's why the documentation is so comprehensive. But still, you cannot fix it. You cannot get in and see what's going on. And that's that I don't particularly like. The API, I don't particularly like it. I find it, it isn't particularly object-oriented. So you have functions where the value to value a bond, you passed in not just the description of the bond. You, you passed it both the description of the bond and the description of the model all in, into the function at the same time. Whereas I like to conceptually separate them out because I think for very many reasons, it makes far more sense to do it my way. And it's not easy to integrate MATLAB into an existing system. Okay, you can do it, but it's not that easy. There is another alternative called Quantlib. Uh, Quantlib is a free open source C++ library. It's very comprehensive. It's been well tested. It's fast. But the code is very complex. It's been highly refactored over the years. To find out where a calculation is being done, you've got to basically, obviously, sometimes you've got to sort of go down sort of three, four, five layers of the code. And even then, it's not particularly obvious what's going on. And if you want to change something or debug something or add something, I think you, you really need to spend a year or something like that just learning the library before you can do that. There are other libraries out there. There's Open Gamma, which is in Java, which looks good. Um, and there are also third-party vendors, but they sell libraries in other languages. They're expensive and they're black boxes. So there doesn't seem to be anything in Python out there that I've been able to find that does what Finance Pi does. So I think Finance Pi is, is plugging a gap. So if you want to use Finance Pi, um, it's very straightforward. You just do pip install Finance Pi. You can download the repo if you want and look in the notebooks folder. And <clears throat> so if you go to the, re the GitHub repository, you'll see how it's organized. There's a notebooks folder, and that contains about 70 or 80 notebooks that I've set up. And they're organized by model and product type, and you can, you know, people can immediately start being productive with those. So I'm looking forward to your feedback on that. Um, uh, as I said, right now it's been mostly me, and uh, I've had two two people who've done some work in the library. But I am interested in contributors to the library. the The main there are some Python based tasks that are that you know would be useful to have people help with. But really, most of the tasks that I need help with are ones which probably require some knowledge of finance and derivative pricing. So if there are any people out there who have that knowledge and are willing to contribute, you know, please, please get in touch. So I put a list of issues on the GitHub repository. I have a whole list of things, future work to do with commodities, securitized products, mortgage-backed securities. So I have a whole list of things that I want to add to the library, but uh, I won't go through them now. So let me just com com finish with a few comments about Finance Pi. Um, it's transparent, so it's open source. It's documented. I've got a big user guide that you can look at, and obviously the code is pretty well documented as well. So it's easy and understandable to people to understand exactly what's going on, which is important. It's low cost, yeah, it's free. It's comprehensive, yes, it covers a broad range of financial derivatives, and that will only expand, but already it's pretty broad. Responsive, because it's written in Python, and it's, it's very easy to go in and make a change. So if there's a bug or something, somebody wants some new functionality, the whole framework just makes it very easy to go in and add new things and release things quickly. I have a very comprehensive set of test cases, so you know you can do that. And you know, just make sure it doesn't break anything. Uh, but it's very easy to turn things around. The design, I think, is is 
favorable to people who are working in the markets. It's very product focused, which is how people think about it in the market. They're not, they're not analyzing models. They just want to get a price for a product. And this is how the, the library is designed. The interface uses leverages the Jupyter Notebook, which I think is a very attractive interface, very nice. It's fast, as I've shown you, it can compete with C++. And it's the only fully Python finance pricing library that, I, that I'm aware of. So I'm hoping it will gain more users, and I hope it will develop to become a useful tool for those people needing a, a finance library. And I want to thank you for all your interest, and I look forward to getting your feedback and questions. There are any? Thank you, Dominic, uh, for that great session. Uh, maybe if you could uh, go back uh, to AirMeet and you know share your video, uh, we can. We have a few questions that maybe we can use the next five minutes. Perfect. Okay. We, we see you. Uh, so the first question uh, is uh, from uh, Ram. You know, he says the fin date takes a year, month, and date. Is it possible to use the model to do an intraday valuation? Oh, well, <clears throat> you, to say to, to do an intraday valuation, I mean, most valuations are done not intraday. Uh, there are some markets like the FX market where you could actually, the actual time at which you, the option expires and which the time at which you're pricing it do actually come into it. So. Right now, no, everything is done in units of days. So no, the answer is no. But that could be, it could be extended to be able to handle that. But in all my experience, apart from doing very, very short dated FX options, it's pretty rare for anybody to ever think about intraday valuation. Normally, when you're doing a valuation, you're doing it at a particular time. And so if there's a particular trade going on and somebody wants to value a trade, they look at the market exactly that moment, but they count in integer dates to the expiry date. It really doesn't change the valuation very much by changing a couple of hours, except if it's a really, really, really short dated product. So the answer is no, not right now, but it, it, it wouldn't be hard to add it. Okay, uh, and another question from him is, is it possible to calculate the implied volatility from an options market price? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the equity options or the FX options, yes, you pass, there is an implied volatility function. It's one of the, the class does, there is an implied volatility function, yeah. So you pass in the price and it gives you back the implied volatility. Perfect. Uh, we have a couple of questions from uh, Priya Brata. So can we do like a credit risk analysis uh, for an equity portfolio, for example, using finance pay? Right, I'm just looking for the question in the list. Can we do a credit, credit risk analysis? Risk. Mm -hmm. um, it depends what you mean. Yeah, OK. So credit risk analysis. Credit risk is, is kind of my area or was my specialty. So, But there are a number of ways of doing credit risk analysis. So one is to have some sort of model for assessing the credit risk of a particular company, a counterparty. So you can do that. There's a model in there. There's the equity. There's Merton's firm value model that's been implemented in the library. So you could use that. Um, other credit risk analysis. I mean, there's a lot of credit derivative valuation and credit related stuff in there, but it's not exactly perhaps what the person, what uh, Ria Bata is asking about. So if she would. If she wants to contact me directly and ask me in more detail exactly what say exactly what she wants, then I could give her a, a more detailed response. Perfect. Uh, so Priya Brother, maybe you can head head out to the uh, Zulip chat, and Dominic will be available there to answer your more specific question. Or you can join a lounge and talk directly one on one as well. Um, another question we have is from Kalyan. Uh, he says. How can finance by help uh, fund managers to examine their uh, trading strategy? OK, so this is something I'm thinking about adding to the library, which is a. So if you're doing a trading strategy, if it's a trading strategy involving something very simple like equities, you don't need finance pie to do that, although finance pie could potentially help. If you're doing a trading strategy that, that involves a 
set of derivatives, then everything becomes more complicated because you need to say, you know, what is the price of my derivatives in this particular market environment? So what I do want to do is I want to set up a kind of a, a way to create some sort of portfolio of trades and then to push through those kind of scenarios and see the valuations. And that shouldn't be very hard to do because really it's just taking a whole, it's almost like taking a list of market objects and almost like pushing those to the valuation object uh, method of the class. So once again, if, if the person who asked wants to send me a more direct, um, Kalyan, is Kalyan Prasad, if Kalyan wants to send me a more specific question about a specific need, then I'll definitely have a look at it. All right. Uh, so we have one last question. Um, after that, you know, we can switch over to the lounge or to the Zulip chat for more direct questions. Uh, so the interest rate that was used in the valuation of an option, was that a central bank interest or, you know, was it you know, some other like a dummy interest? OK, now you're touching on a very uh, big area of finance and one that's actually in a huge state of flux at the moment. So um, the interest rate used to be the interest rate that was implied by what's called LIBOR, which has got a lot of bad press following 2008. Um, and it's now being gradually moved out. What's actually what we actually use is what's called the overnight index swap rate. So there are products called overnight index swaps, which are to do with central bank interest rates. And the overnight index swap um, is a measure of what the rate will be over some particular period of time. So I don't want to go into all the finance behind it because it's all very complicated, but overnight index swap. But the way I'm using it there, it isn't specific to any particular type. Okay, that's okay. So anyway, so if you want to talk to me more about that and the assumptions there, I'm happy to, to respond directly. Perfect. Yeah, so we got uh, really good feedback uh, from all of the attendees, uh, Dominic. So thanks again for your session. Um, again, you know, if you can head over to the launch or, you know, you know, hang around in the Zulip chat, uh, you know, I'm sure there are more questions for you, which you can take directly as well. Okay. Thank you to everybody for listening. Thanks a lot for your talk. Bye.